dropped out of high school and did that. So, I see that our government has put us in this situation. You know, and when you live in a big city like Columbia, well, Columbia's not a big city compared to Atlanta, but when you live in a, a, a metro area like Columbia, Lexington County, Richmond County, there's a lot more job opportunities here than it is when you go to a small yeah. town like Allendale, Barnwell, Saluda, these little areas out here. When you go to areas like Saluda where they had a military plant, that town depended upon the jobs that military plant opened down. Produced. When that military plant shuts down, it's not like they've got a hundred other places they can go look for work. Yeah, they got Burger King, they got the Busy Bee store, and, and, and those type of places, but there's not enough employment opportunities. So now you got people that were working in these big plants, they were making $12 to $15 an hour, now they're unemployed. Now where are they going to go? They're going to go work for seven twenty-five an hour. Listen, I, well, they got now they got to drive fifty miles to Greenwood or to Augusta to try to find more work. And, and we got, got you need people to work because they got to fund all your old people's social security. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> they got to fund yours too. Right. 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 has the right to ask a question. I think he got a little incident earlier when he was discussing the Ponzi scheme with someone. So Terry yeah, his left hook. This bird himself himself he thinks from uh, uh, Pastor Way, uh, Roosevelt Way, he's come in and talk about his situation. But go ahead and tell us about the Ponzi. What is the minimum wage? What is it? I think it's seven twenty five an hour. Price control. Is that the minimum uh, amount of money that a laborer is going to take home or is it or is it the minimum no. cost to no. an employee. No, no, it's not even that. It's meter one. Yeah. It's meter one. It's meter one. It's meter one. So the minimum wage is not seven and a quarter an hour. It's seven and a quarter an hour minus the money that he gives to me to take care of me. Because that's the first priority of somebody starting out in life today in this country. Is to take care of me. Right. After he takes care of me, then he can take care of himself. Yep. It's absurd. But that's what we have. Well, and the intellectual people are now sitting on his ass and doesn't say a damn word about it. I can't even get Corey upset about it. He's <laughs> upset about it. What's he going to do? Nothing. For, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mr. Burbage uh, contributes periodically to the Wall Street Journal. And he always has some great points here. In the room. I can't, I can't get you upset enough to send your checks back. <laughs> That's right. Look at here. What you you look? If Ron Paul can stand up and say, "I worked over 20 years in Congress, and I am not going to take a retirement check. This is my final year in Congress. Win the presidency or lose the presidency. When I go back to Texas, I ain't going to draw a retirement check. I ain't going to accept it." I think you should be able to do the same thing with your Social Security. There you go. What? Uh, what do you think? Let me ask you another question. Are you one. with me? Let me ask you another question. Are you with me? No. <laughs> no, so you want that check? No. Me neither. Need a few more people from Bill. Hang on, Bill. How about that one? Yeah, hold safe. Just wait on me. Grab them away before we start. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ray Morris here. Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, Ray, yeah. Thank you. I didn't Let's get give uh, Ray more hands. Yeah. that's going to be coming up in uh, January. Maybe there'll be another chance to talk about it. Bill 4128 in the House, and I think it's 862 in the Senate. And basically it's an effort to monetize gold and silver as currency, where it can actually be used as currency in the state of South Carolina. It may seem a little strange to you, but the Constitution expressly states that that is the only way it's in Article 1, Section 10, that we can only use gold and silver in payment of debts. That's actually in the document. It's just been ignored uh, for over about 100 years since the implementation of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. So our plan, and so as chairman of this committee, which I'm a member, so 
um, <clears throat> is to, as the dollar collapses, and you have to be living in a cave not to see what's happening to money in, in America. Inflation is consuming our dollars, and they're becoming more and more worthless. And so the idea is, as the dollar is eroded and collapses as a viable currency, I mean, we're spending it today, but a year from now it might not be worth the paper it's written on, we'll actually have a currency in place, and, and, and gold and silver can become a currency. And when, it, and when a currency collapses in a nation, it creates anarchy, civil disorder. That's what the, a lot of the Occupy uh, argument was about. Was, and and I, we, we have mixed feelings about that. Some are on the violent side, but some of the complaints are very real and very valid. And uh, so as a currency collapses, there will be a replacement currency, uh, gold and silver, and it will anchor and stabilize our South Carolina economy. Will actually, you can't. Can you imagine a state that didn't have a functional currency? It's like not having water. I mean, what would we do if there was no water? It was dirty or misdistributed. We would have real confusion, wouldn't we? So that's what this is about, and I'm sure there'll be some time to talk about it later. But uh, this is a critical legislation in the January session, and we're going to need everybody mobilizing because the reason I'm really here to make this announcement is we thought we were expecting uh, this to be brought up in the Republican. Uh, caucus meeting down at the Myrtle Beach uh, a couple of days ago. It was supposed to get on the agenda as a priority item. And we had some very good legislators who were pushing for this, and I hate to have to tell you this, but the leadership of the party, uh, the speaker and some of the senior leaders, kept it off the agenda. And so they didn't want it to come up, and they, they didn't allow an agenda to be discussed. So suddenly we thought this was going to emerge as an item and it's just off the agenda. So they're, not, they're going to try to push this to the back of the line. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It really is a, a working man or a middle class issue more than anything else. So we think we're going to try to have to appeal to Democrats um, more, more than some of the Republicans. Um, and we can get into that a little bit later. So this is uh, what it's about. So keep that in mind that we're going to have a kind of a different type of coalition. The Republican leadership are going to fight it. We think a lot of the Republican legislators will want it, but they're not in the leadership. So that was the first thing. And then, uh, so I wanted to make that commercial. And then uh, I'm in a min I have a ministry. I'm a retired Army chaplain, and we've got a ministry called the Exodus Mandate Project. And there's an effort to get Christians, churches, and families to do Christian schooling and homeschooling rather than public schooling. And I've been working on this 15 years. I'm the national uh, president of this ministry. It's a small national ministry. We have a coalition of dozens of similar groups around the country. And we've just come out with a powerful movie called Indoctrination. And it's called Public, the subtitle is Public Schools and the Decline of Christianity in America. And we had 2,000, uh, it's been out uh, nearly three weeks now. We had 2,000 orders in the first week. It's going all over the country. So I just want to let you know about it. Come to me after the meeting, and uh, if you want a copy, we can talk about it. Thanks for that. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Right. Yeah. 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 Bobby here wearing his Nazi armband whenever he... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we don't fully know what happened. We know they kept it off the agenda, which was, was a surprise to us. Yeah, SC Sound Money, good chance. Uh, there's a lot of detail, a lot more information here, but because of a limited time today, and our focus is on the hungry and uh, homeless here in the state. Uh, Rachel will say... The chairman's our, uh, Steve is our chairman, so he's the, I'm, I'm his backup guy. Right. He's the one who got to do this mess to begin with. Okay. Uh, Reverend Wade, would you come up and, and talk about the situation here in South Carolina? Um, Breakthrough Covenant Christian Center. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm um, Pastor Wade. I'm going to give you a little background. Um, I've been born and raised in South Carolina. I attended Airport High School. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm 87. All right. 85. 85. 85. And um, I'm born and raised here in Gaston. And um, I attended East Tennessee State University um, and have a degree in criminal justice and mind and social work. But my passion was to help people. And often I, uh, a couple of years ago, I received my call in my life. But one of the main concerns was for me as as I was going raising up of just helping people and finding a way how to help people. And so now we are located in the Grand Beach right here. 
uh, West Columbia area there. So we are initially, the idea of the vision of the church, the vision of God has given me, is to install a food pantry and also to to empower the people. First, let me discuss this here. Um, we want to try to indulge a training center. How to train individuals, no matter what color, what creed, where you come from, but to learn how to train people to be productive. Because you can you can do all the talking you want. And but if you don't know how to do or have the ability to do it, that's all you're gonna do is talk. You know what I mean? And we believe I I say that why is this one food bank in the West Columbia area, in the Lexington area? You know, there of course there are different outreaches of churches, but they are capped by how much they can do for individuals. Right. And my idea was to look beyond that, even like the size of the Harvest Food Bank, to help, to really help the ones who need help. Not just a helping hand because they in need, but um, give them more besides food. You know what I mean? Give them more besides the idea that you just come in and get a free meal and leave, and then next week we'll see you again, and then even before you got a, a, a circle going around, you know what I mean? So we came an idea to initiate a food bank and we are a non-interdenomination church. And most of you hear at times we say non-denomination church. And what we mean by interdenomination, everybody's welcome. Uh -huh. No matter what creed, what color, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, we welcome everybody as you is. Because we think it is, a, it's, um, even though there's, there's separation that has been taught so much that, you know what I mean, that even, I heard, uh, uh, a sermon one time that said the most segregated time of the week is Sunday morning. Come on, That's it's right. Sunday morning. Everybody go to their church. Everybody do their own thing. It's Sunday morning between ten thirty and one o'clock. But I want to make an impact that everyone can worship together and fellowship together, and and, and, and come on one idea. And I love this idea that you have here. That look here that people, different people can come together and discuss ideals and thoughts we're going at. Because I found out that we got too many people, someone said, you know what I mean, the, you got educated people that working at McDonald's, Burger King, and they need help. Because no one is not training them. We Somehow the, the, the generation come up, we are, uh, it's a different breed. A different breed. We're coming up, we have to earn, I remember I had to, I had to work for my, my car. Now it's given now. Right. You know what I mean? I have a son that's in uni, uh, USC Spartanburg, and he just studied computer science. But I want to make an impact, and I miss making an impact, in the West Columbia area. Too often, I'm not the one about just talking about it, but what can we do to make it happen? And they take a collateral people to come together to make it happen because the ministry is not going to affect one group, but it's going to affect the whole group of the people. Amen. And um, so that's the idea that we have right here in Granby Village for the ministry, is because the impact that we're trying to make, we're trying to make an immediate impact. And uh, to say, don't despise small beginnings. I'm, I'm, I'm radical. I don't believe you got to start small. If the idea is great and you got the people behind you, it can happen. But to impact the people like with food, shelter, clothing, and then when and then the ones they get there, you also, you know what I mean? It's not just helping people. Anybody can help anybody. But can you train the person to be a productive citizen? Can you help them to 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 get a job? You know what I mean? And then also, you know what I mean, then you gotta set some standards in your ministry. You know what I mean? What are you willing to do for us to help you? Are you willing to take a drug test? Right. Are you willing to uh, 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 live in a shelter and with some rules and regulations? Yes, many is doing that, but you notice after a week or two, they go back out and do the same thing, or they quit or uh, don't no longer want to be part of that that, that standard, whatever. But it's all to deal with empowering them, changing their mind. Giving a man a different old woman a different outlook how to live. When you used to one thing all your life, that you're accustomed to. And and the thing is to challenge it, not only to challenge them, but also to to set up a center for learning. 
And someone said by by the youth. Yes. yes. I think I think I don't know the percentage, but I know it's less and less people who graduate from high school these days. Because there's something going on that that the leadership, we don't have many um, mentors like we should, especially in the black community, because half of them are locked up or because of what they've done or because of any community now. Now it's, it's all across the board now. Everybody is going through now. Everybody is on a budget now. Everybody's on the budget. Things are tight now. Some say, some don't want to recognize as a recipient, but things are not, things are getting out of hand now. In the community, now people is, is just, it's just crazy stuff. Stuff you ain't never heard from what people doing now were done a couple of years ago because they're panicking. And when you panic, you bang in fear. And fear will make a man or a woman do anything to survive. And when you don't find out the understanding what causes them to do that, then you will find yourself uh, uh, um, in that category. Right. You also, you know what I mean? Or you, you, everyone knows somebody right now, you ain't no show of hands, but that either homeless, jobless, or in the welfare program. Right. You know what I mean? And many times, like I say, if you're in a, uh, we set up a program in our ministry, right now we started, and we have several people, we, we, we do, um, help people to get jobs, and we also, the ones that own welfare, teach them how to get, or show them how to get off welfare. But, you know what I mean? Because we, in our minds, we believe that you shouldn't depend on the government system to live. So what we do, we equip them, we have, we have a, 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 like a, a small training center that we have people that will take the people, look for jobs, show them how to fill out the application, Find a way for their transportation because we don't want them to depend on the ministry, but being able themselves to learn how to survive and, and do the things they need to do to get done. So the, the summing up is that it's going to take everybody in here. As a pastor, I need everybody here who lives in West Columbia, Columbia area. It doesn't make no difference. I will receive your help. No matter what creed color you come from. You'll work. Yes, sir. That's the way. Uh, Scott Morgan from Harvest Hope just called. Yes, sir. He would be here. His, his mother failed this morning, so he's not here. Okay. But he wants your contact information so he can contact you. But, so Harvest Hope, who does a lot of food bank work here in uh, Midlands. Yes, sir. That's great. He would like to talk to you, see if y'all can work out some kind of mutual arrangement to help with the food. So could you give on the video, could you give your contact information? Yes, sir. My contact information, I'm Pastor Roosevelt Way. Um, my air code 803 451 Nine zero zero seven. Eight zero three four five one nine zero zero seven. I'm sorry, one more time. <laughs> I'm slow. Yes, sir. You are right. Uh, Erico eight zero three, Corsi, South Carolina. Four five four five one nine zero zero seven. That's my contact number. And we are just in the moment, nobody. Let me ask a question. Uh, we have our new mayor of West Columbia with us, and uh, I know Joe hasn't been there long enough to uh, state any official policy, but he has some opinions on this situation. Joe, you want to say anything about the homeless situation in West Columbia? Uh, yeah, I, I do. We, even though I'm newly elected mayor, I have a long history with West Columbia. I served on city council for three terms and a tour on county council. David and I both. I think he had two tours. And and homeless, here here we are in a situation that we're anti this and anti that, but mm -hmm. boil it down to gravy, you got to take care of your disadvantaged and your poor somehow, some way. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's, that's the bottom line. And I know nobody wants any more taxes. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people feel as though, hey, I've got mine tough. To right, right, right. But, we got to change that way of thinking. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I I come from very diverse feelings in West London. Turn AME Church. I ran for mayor. Seventy nine votes cast. I got sixty five. Amen. So uh, I, I I know the people. They trust me. And not not just in that community though. All over my city, the Mill Hill. 
We got people up there trying to live on five and six hundred dollars in Social Security money, and that's, that's a tough deal. So, uh, anything I can do to help? City administrator and I talked about this during the campaign, and we're going to try to be as a city proactive uh, with respect to the homeless. People give Garland Ramsey a lot of flack about he's made a small fortune, but he in real estate, but he's provided a lot of food for a lot of homeless people over the years, so you got to give kudos to that. So, uh, any way I can help, I'll, I'll be more than happy to chime in. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Let's give Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. We have some uh, questions, some points. Uh, uh, Pastor Wayne, there's, there's one of the points I know is going to come up here in our group, and that is uh, a lot of us, uh, we have Talbert Black, uh, leader here of Campaign for Liberty. We have Corey Norris, founder of the Lexington Tea Party. Uh, we have the Honorable uh, David James, uh, former county councilman. And uh, most of us are conservative here. Uh, yes, sir. Regardless of the party label, we, we don't want government to get bigger. But if, if people were able to keep more of their own money, the churches play a critical role in this. Yes, sir. And that's outside the purview of the government. Uh, what's your feelings about uh, having the churches take a bigger role and in, in, uh, the government taking a lesser role in, in well, yes, sir. Well, uh, my, my personal feeling about the government is that, that, let me back up here. First, you got to teach the people to help themselves. Now we got the church and state separate. And I believe that if we're going to make an, an impact, uh, and just my belief that, you know what I mean, that, that in certain, in certain times, I believe that a church should get involved in government issues. At certain times, uh, I believe that sometimes it could come but so political down that that even as a leader that your ideals and, and your belief system can can rule into your congregation. Whether it be wrong or be right, depends on the person who you're talking to. You know. Uh, but if we don't work together as a government, like especially in West Columbia, Lexington, Richmond County, that we don't have the, the great funding that coming in, the big ministry that coming in. Because um, a lot of us, uh, uh, including myself, it is a paycheck away from being homeless. You know what I mean? Being, being uh, on a budget, you know what I mean? Uh, and so, but I just, I don't know, I believe in not giving involved in a big government, but also on a local level. It got to be some commitment. It got to be some kind of bonding between the local government and the ministry in the community. Cause right. You can't have one working for the community and the other one not. you got to come together, collaborate, how we're going to do this, how we're going to work this out, what kind of plan we're going to have to come up with, and how can we affect the community? Right. How can we affect the homeless? And Yes, ma'am. Okay. So are you finished just when you finish? No, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, now I have a question because there are... are a lot of different entities that try to do what you're trying to do. Here. Yes, ma'am. So how are you different? I'm different. My name is Pastor Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a radical man. I'm a radical preacher. My beliefs, my beliefs is different than other pastors. I know you hear the same, but you have to come to the ministry to find out. I believe that I can say it, I can do it. That's my belief. Um, anything I, I, I just have that belief. You put a Christian on context of what you're doing. That's what you're telling us, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and, but, let's say, I want to make it, um, that we, that was a we enter denomination. Not non but everybody but because we have uh, a multicultural church. That's right. But I just believe that, look here, I am, you know, you can sit around saying, like, I'm tired of seeing this, I'm tired of doing this, and why no one that making a difference? Well, you, sooner or later, you're going to point the finger at yourself. We talking about somebody else not doing nothing, but we hadn't did that ourselves to make a difference in the community. Yes, sir. Uh, Eddie, you had a question? Yeah. I'm just gonna say I, I, I like what you're talking about. Uh huh. And it, 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 remi it reminds me of when one of the disciples asked uh, Jesus, "Who's my neighbor?" Mm -hmm. And right. Jesus gave uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. That's right. And what most people don't realize was that during that era, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Mm -hmm. A Jew would not even take a shortcut and walk through Samaria. They despised Samaritans. 
And Samaritans despise Jews. And Jesus gives this parable. It's where this Jew is going along and he gets he gets mugged. He gets beat up, stomped on, they rip his clothes off of him, leave him naked, steal all his money, and they just leave him lying on the side of the road. Well, who comes walking along the highway but a priest? Well, you would expect the priest to stop and help the guy. Mm -hmm. The priest looks over and sees this guy all beat up, naked, bloody, and he just walks to the other side of the street and keeps on walking. Mm -hmm. Then the, then the um, um, Levite, who is a priest, comes along, a minister, and does the same thing and ignores him. The third person comes along who is a Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Now, you would expect the Samaritan to be the one to walk around and ignore the Jew because right. Samaritans hate Jews. Just like Jews hate Samaritans. But the Samaritan comes along and sees this Jew down here. He gets down there. He cleans him up, bandages him up, puts him on his donkey, takes him to the next motel, next motel six. Uh -huh. Goes in there and says, hey, man, I got some money here. I'm going to pay for this cat's room, make sure he gets better. When I come back here next week, if he's still not better, I'll give you some more money to take to take care of. And then Jesus says, well, who, who's, the, who's the neighbor? Well, the neighbor was the Samaritan. And if you're visiting South Carolina, drop by the Shawnee's Restaurant on Airport Boulevard here in Casey, South Carolina. Until next week, Steve Eisen signing off. Thanks.